We are going to read the first chapter only of Christ in Concrete by Pietro di Donato. Normally I assign the entire book, but given the extraordinary circumstances we are in, I think that it would be sufficient to at least approach the book and get a sense of what it entails. This is not an easy book to read. And in fact, for many students in the past, this turned out to be the single most difficult text they had ever encountered. Some students commented that Shakespeare and uh, Beowulf uh, are much more difficult, but those are very ancient texts. This was written in 1939, this contemporary, and it presents a different degree of difficulty. It will become immediately apparent that this is not a traditional book with a narrator and characters that dialogue among themselves. It is multi-layered and it mixes together narration from the point of view of the writer, but also narration from the point of view of the various characters inside the story. Not only but this narration is about the facts that happen in reality and also about the thoughts that occur in their own mind, the process of thoughts that goes on in their own minds. So all of these different levels of uh, narration are brought together and one after the other in very rapid sequence. So you may have a description of a scene you may have the thoughts of a character, then you may have a line of dialogue by a different character, the thoughts of a third character, and so forth. What makes it even more difficult is the fact that in many cases, these thoughts or dialogue lines are not attributed specifically to a person. So we hear these things and we don't know who is saying exactly the same words, although we can reconstruct it. It is, in a way, an attempt to describe what goes on in our own mind and through the senses. Visually, auditorily, our thoughts and the words that come out. Even dreams are thrown in in this, uh, in this sequence. So the chaos that goes on in your mind, if you were to try to describe it uh, or to put it down uh, linearly, because that's the only way you can narrate, linearly, then you would have exactly all this sort of uh, sensory um, narrations, what your senses register, plus the thought process inside yourself, plus dealing with the emotions that ge are generated inside of yourself, plus the lines of dialogues that you are going to utter or that you hear from the outside. So take all this mess, try to make a straight line, and then more or less what you get is uh, the narration that Piero, that Pietro di Donato gives us. Second, the characters, the main characters are, is a group of Italian bricklayers, from Brooklyn, by the way, who speak Italian among themselves. By the way, if you've ever looked at uh, the main campus, the, the quad in Brooklyn, you will see that those buildings are all bricks. They were literally made by these very people that Di Donato is talking about. He was himself a bricklayer, and the story that he tells is semi-autobiographical. Um, Jeremio is based on his father. What happened to, his, to Jeremio is close to what happened to his father. And many of the characters are drawn from his own memory and from the reality of his own life. Now, these Italian laborers speak Italian among themselves, or even probably a dialect. And in order to render the difference, instead of translating, Pietro di Donato transliterates. What is the difference? When you translate, you render in a different language the meaning of what the source text gives you. For instance, in the very first page, there is an expression, old age is a carry-on. Now, 
This is a transliteration of the Italian expression, la vecchiaia è una carogna. Carogna, carrion, is the putrefying body of an animal, of a killed dead animal. Okay? So, carrion in Italian carries that meaning. In English, the translation would be old age is a bitch. Di Donato does not translate, he transliterates. So, he takes Italian word by word, when there is dialogue, of course, and renders that in English. And it is very effective. I'll give you another example. There are tons in the book. Another that comes up very often is uh, Mother Mine. Transliteration of Madre Mia, which is not Mamma Mia. It's a different thing. In English, it would be Mother of Mine. But the transliteration is Mother Mine. When these people invocate um, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, the transliteration gives us Gesù, Giuseppe, Marie. It's not Jesus, Joseph, and Mary. It keeps the Italian words. And the spelling is changed so as to um, adapt itself to the English readers. How to read this book? Number one, if you can, read it out loud. If you can't read it out loud, read it out loud in your head. Second, read it slowly. You must find the rhythm of the writer, but also your own rhythm. Once you find your own rhythm, then the meaning will become apparent. In order to find the rhythm, you have to start reading it very slowly. And I'm going to read with you and for you the first page and a couple other excerpts, excerpts from the first chapter. So read it out loud in your mind, in your head, read it slowly and find the rhythm. Once you find the rhythm, then you can accelerate and you will, you will be able to absorb the meaning. The meaning will be transparent. So here we go with uh, page one, or actually page 17, uh, in the manuscript, in the, the file that I sent you. March whistled the stinging snow against the brick walls and up the gaunt girders. Jeremio de Foreman swung his arms about and gave the man on. Old Nick the Lean stood up from over a dust-flying brick pile, tapped the side of his nose, and sent an oyster directly to the ground. Master Jeremio, the devil himself could not break his tail any harder than we hear. Burly Julio of the Walrus Mustache and, and known as the snout nose, let fall the chute door of the concrete hopper and sang over in the lean's direction. Marie and Nina's belly and the burning night will make me, will make of me once more a milk-mouthed stripling lad. The lean loaded his wheelbarrow and spat furiously, son of two-legged dogs, despised of even the devil himself, Work, sure, for America Beautiful will eat you and spit your bones into the earth's soul. Work. And with that, his wiry frame pitched the barrel violently over the rough floor. Snout nose, waved his head to and fro, and with mock pathos wailed, Sing on of a guitar of mine. Short, cheery-faced Thomas, the scaffold man paused with hatchet in hand and ten penny spike sticking out from small dice like teeth to tell the lean as he went by in a voice that all could hear. Oh, father of countless chicks, the old age is a carrion. Jeremio chuckled and called to him. Hey, little Thomas, who are you to talk? You and Big Tidacola 
can't even hatch an egg, whereas the lean has just to turn the doorknob of his bedroom and old Philomena becomes a balloon. Number one, don't bother try to remember, trying to remember the names or don't try to remember the uh, names and what they're saying, associating the character with the words. It doesn't make any difference. This is a group of bricklayers or workers who are teasing each other, they are making fun of each other. And I'll go pick up a few of the expressions that the Donato throws in, which is the slang of the people. Uh, for instance, when we have at the very beginning the lean who sent an oyster directly to the ground, oyster is basically whatever gunk accumulates inside your nostrils, and the lean uh, just blow one of these oysters straight down onto the floor, onto the ground, the way that they called it, the oyster. Now, Another word, uh, the carrion, we came across the carrion already. Um, then you have this um, snout nose that um, mocks Olin and, uh, the lean and says, sing on of guitar of mine. In English it would be something like bring the violins, bring out the violins. Uh, he's mocking him for his complaining. Um, and other things like this. Obviously, Jeremio is making fun of Thomas, who cannot have children with big titted cola, while Belin uh, apparently has many children and his wife Filomena is always pregnant. I'm going to continue, same page at the bottom, and then we'll turn the page. Coarse throats tickled and mouths opened wide in laughter. The lean pushed his barrow on, his face cruelly furred with time and struggle. Syrupy sweat seeped from beneath his cap, down his bunny nose, and turned icy at its end. He muttered to himself, saints up, down, sideways, and inside out. How many more stones must I carry before I'm overstuffed with the life today? I don't understand the blood of virgin. I don't understand. Mike, the barrel mouth, pretended he was talking to himself and yelled out in his best English. He was always speaking English while the rest carried on in their native Italian. I don't know myself, but somebody's got a got bigger bunch of kids and all a, all a time stuck up from somebody else. Jeremio knew it was meant for him and he laughed on the tomb of St. Pimple Legs. This little boy my wife is giving me next week shall be the last. Eight hungry little Christians to feed is enough for any man. Thomas nodded to the rest. Sure, Master Jeremio had a telephone call from the next bambino. Yes, it told him it had a little bell between instead of a rose bush. It even told in his name. Now, the, obviously, the little bell in the rose bush is a reference to the genitals, right? The gender of uh, the sex of the child. Let's let's go now to page 22, about two thirds down, the paragraph uh, that starts with, "The men were transformed." The men were transformed into single silent beasts. Snout nose steamed through ragged mustache, whiplashing sand into mixer. Ashes ass dragged under four by twelve beam. Lean clawed walnuts jumping in jaws, masering crumbled, dust billowed, thunder choked. Not a single period, comma, or other punctuation mark. It is straightforward. It, the way it comes in real life, there is no pause. All these actions are either simultaneous or they happen in rapid sequence. I would say that here it tries to render the simultaneous, um, the simultaneous actions occurring. 
And now let's go back to page 21, the second paragraph down from the beginning of the chapter. This is an example of onomatopoeia, where the sound of words renders the sounds of reality. English is particularly suited for this kind of uh, uh, linguistic exercise, literary exercise. But here you will see, again, a much longer passage without punctuation, and it's very hard to follow. In fact, I don't even, I won't even try to follow the meaning of it. I will read the words because I think what really matters here is exactly that, how the sound of uh, this mechanical industrial reality is translated into the sound of the language itself. And this is called onomatopoeia. I'll start with trowel rang. Trowel rang through brick and slashed mortar. Rivets were machine gunned fast with angry grind. Patsy number one, check. Patsy number two, check. The lean three, check. Julio four, still bellowed. Back at hammer, donkey engine scuffed purple ash ass Pietro. 15 chisel point intoned stone, thin, still, weird, and wail through wood, liquid stone, flowed with dull rasp through iron veins, and hoist scream through space, Rosario the Fat, 24, and Giacomo Sangini, check. The multitudinous voices of a civilization rose from the surroundings and melted with the efforts on the of the job. Now, I think that the last sentence was superfluous, but he put it there just to make sure that he gave you the information. Later on in the book, when he has trained you well enough, he won't even do that. So, okay, again, um, a lot of different, a mixture of styles and a mixture of devices, literary devices, in order to render reality in a different form than he had been tried before or has been tried normally is tried normally in the standard narrative. I'm going to stop here. It's already long enough and uh, I hope that you will enjoy it and will uh, keep reading because it's worth it.